Thank <laughs> you. Hey, Thomas. I cannot hear you. Not still. Are you able to hear me? I am still not able to hear you. Mm.
Am I speaking? Yes, I think. Okay, I see you responding. So looks like you are able to hear me. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now I can hear you. Oh, I lost you again. Okay, I think I have some problems with the microphone. Um, okay. But now it works. Hopefully. Now it works. Yeah. Now I'm able to hear you properly. Uh, so exciting. Are, are you based in the Eastern time zone or? Uh, oh, okay. I'm in Europe. I'm from Austria. Oh, okay. So you are actually uh, midday probably for you, lunchtime. It's no, it's already in the, it's short before evening. Oh, it's almost in the evening. Okay. So 5 p.m. in my time zone. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that Austria is uh, that uh, much ahead. I'm in Austin, Texas. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's just uh, about 10 o'clock morning right now. Mm -hmm. so. Early in the morning. Yeah. Hello. I would... Hello. So it seems you have quite a packed agenda today. That's great. As always, I ask lots of cool present presentations. Yes, I hope we don't run out of time, but just yeah. You know, but I just posted the link for uh, those of you who don't have it so you can join in. Hello, folks. Hello. Uh, do we have somebody from the conveyor project here already? I'm not entirely sure whether they want to present today or another time. If not, they already have two presentations scheduled, so we should oh, just want to make sure I have somebody join. Hi, this is Bill Dettelback from Red Hat. Hello. Well, are you planning to present on conveyor? Uh, no, I mean, James? Okay. no, I'm, I'm actually not with the conveyor team. I'm with the Quay team, but uh, we're just kind of visiting. We haven't been on a, on a meeting for a while. We actually presented uh, last summer. We're just kind of getting re-engaged with you guys again. So we're just here to listen. Okay, perfectly fine. I just want to ensure that people get a chance to, to present today. Uh, we actually picked a good day because we are pretty much packed, not just on, would never call them boring updates, but not just on updates, but actual uh, project uh, presentations today, which is great. And given that, yeah, the agenda is pretty packed, I would propose we jump right in. Um, if there are anything I can see want to discuss, feel obviously free to add them to the agenda. For presentations, we usually try to keep them to 15 to, to 20 minutes. And okay, we have Q plus here and, and Litmus Chaos. So my proposal, because I already see them here, I would like to start with the Litmus Chaos project update and probably then also in the next step, they want to apply for incubation. Um, I think it's good to see what happened in this project, and we can guess who's here from Litmus Chaos, like your background on Chaos Native here. Um, so Litmus Chaos is a Chaos Engineering Framework, but I'd like to directly pass over to them and give them the stage to give us a short update again, try to keep it to like 15 minutes, uh, roughly, if that's fine for you. 
15 minutes. All right. Uh, I just need to run through then. Um, then I really thought 20, uh, but I'll, I'll try to make it in 15. Thank you. Well, we can make it 22, but so we will survive if it's 20, that's fine. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hi, um, Lois. So basically, we are presenting here uh, uh, because we applied for uh, moving to incubation um, last uh, couple of meetings ago we did uh, discuss here and um, and uh, as part of that I'll provide a quick project snapshot update and also what we have done at the last uh, nine months and where we are uh, in terms of the project itself. So here is the PR. Um, we applied this around uh, November uh, KubeCon time frame and after that uh, We've been a bit busy uh, really working through the Litmus 2.0 uh, and also there was a big community event. Um, so this is a good time uh, to come back and present. Um, and uh, on the project <clears throat> snapshot update, um, earlier, I mean, maintainers uh, remain same. Uh, Intuit continues to be active. Uh, Amazon is a doc maintainer. And the primary sponsor is, uh, we were a team uh, under Maya Data and recently um, we spun off the project uh, or the team uh, to start as Chaos Native uh, with the goal to uh, really uh, focus on Litmus. So that's good news from, uh, at least uh, my time was divided a little bit on two CNCF projects, now it's uh, Litmus, right? Apart from that, uh, uh, happy to state here that apart, uh, we took the stats from DevStats, uh, CNC of DevStats. There are a lot of good contributions that we received from other companies, uh, individuals from these companies. And this uh, count is really a combination of PR or uh, PR reviews or created issues. Um, many notable uh, uh, contributions from Intuit, uh, Ring Central, Red Hat. And Microsoft also has been a continuous help with um, a lot of testing they do on uh, Azure, right? Um, that's the state. And we also maintain a list of uh, adopters. Formally, we encourage whoever is using Litmus to come and tell um, or fill up this application. So far, this is the list. Uh, recently, uh, we got uh, a telco reference as well. Orange has been pretty active in terms of uh, using uh, Litmus for this for their chaos needs, they also presented recently in a conference. Um, a NetApp Intuit was there earlier recently, uh, Captain, uh, Cube Player, uh, Vscale, Orange, Octeto were added. And there are many other large users of the project. They are not yet, um, you know, they have not uh, declared themselves as adopters formally, but uh, there are public references. They are very much active in the community. And they talked about using Litmus in various forms. Some of these are ready to take a, a reference if required uh, by CNCF as they've been using uh, in production and in other forms as well. Um, so that's a quick update on uh, who's using. And uh, in terms of the stats itself, uh, <laughs> We have added about uh, one of the things that we continue to add is the new experiments. Uh, that's the purpose of creating a chaos hub. And we don't want to uh, get the core team to write all the experiments and it's almost impossible, right? With the growth of uh, kind of growth we are seeing everywhere. Um, so that's working well. And uh, in the meantime, we have actually concentrated on building the project itself to have a super solid foundation uh, for chaos at scale, right? So we see uh, the product project adoption uh, slowly increasing with more Slack members joining and asking questions. That's a proof. Um, and uh, there are totally new uh, contributors of 70 plus that were added since the sandbox. And we also have uh, defined many operational SIGs, but uh, four are uh, kindly, uh, I mean, kind of working well. And um, the community meetups uh, continue to happen driven by us. But um, what I primarily wanted to share is there are two other meetups that are started by the community members themselves. So that's a sign of, uh, uh, you know, adoption uh, in different geographies as well. 
Uh, before uh, I have one slide or two slides on Litmus 2.0, the work, but these are kind of a notable features. Uh, we did improve our CS E2E pipelines uh, to deliver patches fast and also on monthly cadence. We never missed a release so far. We almost uh, are releasing a patch release uh, every month apart from the main release. And uh, we did make uh, our uh, architectural goal, our design goal of uh, delivering uh, Litmus portal, uh, it is a huge step towards uh, chaos for multi-tenant and chaos, declarative chaos uh, for cross-cloud uh, ecosystem. And also, uh, we didn't want to stay at experiment level. We want to go to chaos scenarios. We integrated with Argo workflow. There's a lot of feedback on you don't define what chaos studies that it should be. Uh, I will define myself. So we introduced probes, a lot of community work. And one of the other main things that we did is observability improvements, right? Um, a lot of chaos can happen in different forms, but uh, whoever is affected, they should be able to know um, what happened when, right? Uh, was this a problem because chaos was introduced or was it a natural thing? So the context of chaos introduction should be captured uh, uh, in the monitoring system. So we did define that. And uh, a lot of namespace, um, uh, ownership issues came in and we did uh, now litmus can run within a namespace and if developers are sharing uh, a, a large cluster and they own only namespaces they can manage chaos within that so this is like a, a kind of a quick uh, overview and uh, litmus 6 uh, primarily encouraged uh, by other projects like meshery and uh, cncf6 itself there are a lot of uh, community call questions where I want to contribute here, there, my interest is in observability. So we defined six within Litmus. And uh, right now the documentation SIG is working very well. Uh, there were two contributors who are driving the documentation needs of uh, Litmus. Similarly, deployability, two contributors are coming and they manage their own SIG. So that's also working well. And we continue to do uh, SIG testing, SIG uh, orchestration, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. As you can see, that apart from Chaos Native team, there are other members who are actually chairing this, right? So we want this six to be chaired by uh, someone other than Chaos Native team, so that we get uh, more natural uh, feedback uh, and uh, roadmap reviews. And in terms of uh, the contributing orgs, we took it from DevStat, apart from iData, um, which is uh, Chaos Native now. You can see that um, uh, Intuit and uh, Deutsche Telekom, uh, Red Hat, and some of Microsoft itself, some of this uh, are pretty active in contributing. Uh, overall, even though we took top 18, uh, but um, from Sandbox, we got 70 unique contributors. So that's uh, good news to show that uh, the project is actually being contributed to. This is uh, another stat that uh, we wanted to present as you can see that the yellow line is a uh, number of folks. There was a uh, rise in October because of the Hacktoberfest. Uh, other than that, GitHub stars are generally linear. We keep getting uh, a few stars here and there. And uh, the PR issues is actually going down. Uh, that still means that we're working hard to close the issues, right? Uh, um, so there's a lot of work that we are doing. Uh, to fix and uh, we are closing many of them towards litmus 2.0. So these are the notable contributors given 15 minutes time. I'll just uh, rush it through. Uh, primarily uh, Red Hat and Orange are contributing a lot to litmus probes, the definition of them, definition of steady state and uh, how to introduce chaos on cloud platforms from uh, uh, Kubernetes itself. Uh, so that's uh, some of the ideas that they brought in and uh, the ideas to uh, actual code conversion has happened and it is a feature already now. Uh, these are the integrators, uh, integrations. One of the things that we believe uh, for the uptake of Litmus is how uh, well these are integrated into various CACD tools because uh, generally before chaos comes in, the teams are already using the tool. So um, we started working with the Argo workflow. It's not a tool, but uh, you know uh, we wanted to use that uh, to define chaos workflows. But uh, uh, Spinnaker, Captain, GitLab, GitHub, these are the four CACD tools and many are in the pipeline. We're just waiting for some community members or uh, us to uh, prioritize them. 
And Qbert is another integration done by Red Hat where they wanted to introduce uh, for a non-Kubernetes target Qbert VMs, so that went well. And we also have started uh, contributing into the CNF conformance test suite. And Octeto is um, uh, a developer cloud for Kubernetes, so they they get a ready environment and also when they merge the code, they can run chaos with Litmus. So that's a good use case uh, to develop. Um, on the community events, there were a lot of things that we did to make the project easy for users to begin, right? Uh, primarily, we did a lot of uh, videos on YouTube, uh, primarily targeting how to make it easy. And also interactive tutorials on Catacoda. We did uh, orchestrate a good chaos panel discussion involving our own users, project users, as well as users from the other community. And uh, we did have a great event, uh, which was primarily helped by Litmus team as volunteers. Uh, chaos Carnival, uh, apart from Chaos Native team, six Litmus users came and presented how they're using Litmus in various forms. We did have uh, two boot camps. We are also gearing up towards uh, the community bit bridge programs, JSOCs, um, Google Zoom Doc Docs. Uh, Docs is something that we keep uh, a very high importance. And um, another good news is that uh, the cross project uh, collaboration is happening primarily with uh, uh, Argo Workflows and Captain, where uh, you know we keep seeing how to do chaos with uh, continuous delivery uh, and that stuff. So. Uh, these are some of the slides I'll quickly run through from container solutions. Uh, these links are given here, um, uh, the video links, uh, the network chaos, how it was orchestrated uh, by uh, container solutions using Litmus. And this is uh, how Red Hat is using probes, chaining of the probes to define steady state and do keyboard chaos. This was a talk, uh, Captain integration by Jorgen, which was uh, an awesome, well-received one. They've been using Litmus in continuation. Um, and also uh, from IAG, Michael came and talked about how they use AWS uh, EKS uh, chaos uh, using Litmus at scale and uh, for their uh, general application and uh, uh, app replicas, scaling of app replicas, whether that will work or not uh, when some chaos was there. And uh, one of the main things that we added is the GitOps uh, integration into Chaos, right? Uh, this was one of the features that uh, we've been uh, trying to work. Um, uh, how can we scale Chaos itself um, at larger systems? So we kind of have uh, front-end GitOps, back-end GitOps, and uh, we did demonstrate um, uh, it can work with uh, any chaos, uh, sorry, any um, GitOps tools like Argo CD or Flux uh, and also Spinnaker. Um, but um, we did demonstrate this and it is coming out uh, in Toro Zero Beta uh, in about uh, uh, a couple of weeks from now. And Octeto demonstration was good. These are, I'm just putting them here as a proof of it must use us coming in and speaking at, at the public event. Uh, this is a telco reference where uh, they have publicly demonstrated how they have used Litmus uh, for their telco platform chaos needs. Um, so that's about uh, various community updates and uh, the progress that we made in the project. And uh, we are certainly proud of uh, the architecture built up uh, in the last one year. And one of our goals before uh, even we started uh, announcing the Slitmus is a project for public consumption uh, back in uh, 2018. Uh, we had kept certain goals uh, for chaos engineering, right? We want to make them really uh, fit into the cloud native goals. Uh, these are some of the goals that uh, we defined. Um, uh, actually speaking, GitOps was added last year because of the rise of GitOps. So there were four principles that I added uh, two years ago in a CNC blog. So the principles are basically uh, the chaos engineering should be open source. The experiment should be community collaborated uh, for managing the life cycle of chaos itself. You need to follow the operator pattern and CRDs and CRs and for scaling the chaos engineering and to follow the patterns of uh, the scale, you need to uh, work with the GitOps uh, tools out there and for observing chaos, you need to have open observability. You don't want to get locked in into a particular observability system. 
So with this, with the goals, we work towards Litmus 2.0. Uh, the last one year uh, has been fantastic. So I would uh, like to state here that we actually have uh, uh, achieved the feature complete state for all of this. The first three are pretty much in usage, uh, GitOps and Open Observability we are about to release. It's been tested in some form, but uh, this year, I think you know that's the learning that we are willing to uh, take. Uh, overall, 2.0 uh, really means Litmus has changed from being a, a tool for a single user to execute chaos experiments to a kind of a tool set for teams uh, where who are operating a cross cloud environment to execute uh, chaos workflows, not chaos experiment, chaos workflows in highly scalable cloud native environments. And why we state that? Because we did a lot of work, as I mentioned, workflows and uh, there's a chaos portal, GitOps integration, uh, chaos analytics, observability, uh, steady state definition through probes, VM chaos and namespace uh, chaos. So with all this together, Litmus is more formidable uh, to be used by uh, larger enterprises, uh, which are already uh, in use, I would say. So this is, uh, again, a repetition of that. Uh, experiments, uh, we believe, will become a commodity. It's more of a chaos scenarios. And it has moved from per user to teams, per cluster to a multi-tenant uh, cross-cloud system, per organization. You need to manage Litmus at organization level, just like you do a GitOps, uh, a single source of truth, where you keep all the configuration in one place for all the teams together, you can manage chaos in the same way. Uh, chaos experiments are workflows, I would say. Earlier, we used to have all the experiments are put in one public hub, but now teams can have their own private hubs because they develop their own experiments. They want to manage within the organization and some they can upstream, but some they either tune or write and then they keep it. Litmus will work very well in terms of orchestration with private chaos hub. Earlier, it was CLI only, mainly for the observability purpose uh, and ease of use purpose, we brought in GUI as well. And GitOps, uh, which will uh, inherently help with scalability and management. And then uh, the primary uh, new feature is really the probes. Uh, it has got a lot of attention from the community where they will be able to declaratively define what they think is a steady state of the system before introduction of chaos and hypothesis definition, right? It differs from each application, each team using the same application. So they are completely at their uh, flexibility levels to go and define uh, the chaos uh, uh, steady state, sorry. So what is ahead for us, uh, Litmus? We are willing to write more or planning to write more documentation, socialize, uh, with um, GitOps tools, um, and uh, we are trying to get more experiments, which are application specifics, to be contributed uh, to um, to the Chaos Hub. Uh, while we continue to uh, solidify or make the foundation stronger, and um, in the short term, getting to Rod Zero out, getting it used, listening to the community is our goal. But in the midterm, next two quarters, we want to get uh, more chaos types like gRPC, uh, IO chaos. And uh, we also wanted to introduce the Rust library for uh, SDK. Uh, there have been some uh, interest from community. Uh, so we'll, we'll be working on that. And uh, other than that, we would like to work with as many tools as possible in the CNCF ecosystem. Um, and also with other CNC of projects, uh, right? So um, we'll see depending on the bandwidth. So with that, uh, I would like to take some questions. And again, thank you for giving us time here to present. Yeah, uh, thanks. That's uh, a great update. I remember the very first presentation you made, I think more than a year ago. So on 1.0 versus 2.0, um, so 2.0 is already released, and how many of your users would you, is it right? Uh, 2.0, I mean, around uh, three months ago, uh, there is a master branch that we created, uh, right? So um, 2.0 users, there are multiple large users who are using portal already. Uh, I would say about uh, five to 10% users are using. Um, and we're going to announce 2.0 beta March 15th. And then a couple of months from then, it will go into this one. So this is basically the entire community is used to 
a certain way of using uh, a litmus, right? And we don't want to just change them. Hey, here is how you go use it, but rather you just do a slow transition and then uh, move them. Yeah. Maybe especially for your um, incubation proposal, because we had a similar discussion also with um, with the Flux team, or like also between Flux one and Flux two, which I think is actually pretty natural that software evolves, especially in the, these uh, scenarios. Uh, just be clear on what the transition looks like, and especially when that you see wants to talk to users. I think it's also good if you have some that might already be using 2.0. Mm -hmm. Because and, and like some of these things often go in parallel, like a project maturing to like a 2.0 release and the incubation proposal. But from a validation perspective, it's then kind of hard because you talk with a 1.01 uh, users only, and you have to see okay how the people are migrating over. Just just for you as sure. as some input sure. for the for the incubation. Uh, yeah, there are um, some users who are on Litmus 2.0 itself. Uh, mm -hmm. I. I'm not sure I can state their name here. Uh, I can definitely ask them. And then, you know, they, they've been a big couple of uh, big users or big proponents. Uh, they draw a lot of these requirements. So we can definitely uh, get them to speak uh, to to you uh, or whoever is doing the DD. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's some incompatibilities between 1.0 or 2.0, or just keep in mind for the incubation proposal to just say, okay, either if there are not, which is great, or if there are, what the transition path for the users looks like. I mean, everything yeah. makes They're totally uh, compatible, yeah. Okay, uh, that's... Yes, yeah. Yeah, then just put in there, okay, there's not a big... Sure. Uh, big deal. We'll do so, so what exactly do you mean by, by, by GitOps? I mean, Git, um, obviously we've also Cornelia here and um, other people in the GitOps space. So, so what's the GitOps part of the, the, the chaos experiment? Do you react on changes in the system or is this just managing the experiments via the CRDs and then automatically deploying them? Uh, it's both. Maybe Karthik can add a little bit more tech details. Karthik, are you there? Sure. Um, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the GitOps integration allows is more about uh, reacting to um, changes in application on the cluster. So we have an um, event tracker on the cluster that can uh, basically pick up changes made to an application. The application changes itself can be forced by any GitOps tooling like Flux or Argo CD. And uh, that can be a cause for a new experiment to be triggered on that application. It's a way of uh, verifying if a new application, uh, a change in the application actually is uh, good for it. Is it resilient for the system? So we can verify that with an experiment that we can trigger. That's one part of the GitOps story. Um, and the other part is the chaos experiments themselves or the workflows that Uma mentioned um, can be stored in Git and synced on the Litmus portal. Uh, so you always ensure you have a golden copy of your experiments on Git and whenever you make changes there, that is available for you to consume immediately. So that, that's what um, he alluded to when he said front-end and back-end GitOps. I, I hope that uh, answers. Yeah, I think that's, that, that clarifies it. I think it's, uh, it also helps obviously for release validation and things that we do as well. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I think I want to open it up for two other people before we jump to the next presentation. Already asked a lot here. Okay. Just then I would comment. Um, just a comment. I just, as always, very impressive. Um, what you have done both with Litmus and the way that you have explained where you're at and what you're doing with the incubation proposal. So thank you. Great presentation. Thank you, uh, Cornelia. It, it means uh, good uh, <laughs> encouragement coming from you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay, then I would pass over to Cube Plus. Thanks, uh, Alois. Uh, let me share my screen. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Dada Kulkarni, and um, I'll be presenting uh, our tool, uh, Q Plus. So let me uh, oops. Yeah. 
was trying to, okay, there you go. The Zoom link there was creating problems. Okay, so um, uh, I'm founder of CloudArc and at CloudArc we have built uh, or have been building Q plus uh, to solve multi-tenant application stacks, problem of how to create multi-tenant application stacks on Kubernetes. So at CloudArc, we have been working with uh, startups and enterprises uh, who are essentially looking for help to set up their Kubernetes clusters. And um, by that, what I mean is uh, the platform engineering teams uh, are looking help, uh, looking for help to uh, really uh, make sure that their cluster is uh, usable across different workloads. Uh, for example, one startup that we are working with, uh, they want to host uh, MongoDB as a service on Kubernetes and uh, they want uh, to create these MongoDB uh, stacks uh, per tenant. Uh, similarly, there is another uh, startup who is working with um, Moodle and want to create uh, Moodle stacks per tenant. Uh, another enterprise is building a browser as a service on top of Kubernetes. And across all these, um, all these teams, what we have seen is uh, the, the main uh, requirement uh, is that they have a Helm chart of their application package. Um, and from that Helm chart, they want to now create multiple instances uh, per tenant. And for example, in this slide, what I'm showing is uh, the WordPress uh, Helm chart. And let's say for uh, different tenants, I want to create uh, different stacks uh, per tenant uh, of WordPress. And by the way, this is the example I'll be using throughout uh, the demo as a running example through this presentation. So when working with these teams, what uh, we have seen is the challenges that uh, platform engineering teams typically face is how do you really isolate uh, the various resources uh, across different tenants, you know, uh, meaning that, for example, uh, in the case of uh, Moodle as a service, what that uh, startup wants to do is they want to run uh, a Moodle stack uh, for one tenant on one worker node versus uh, for another tenant, they want to deploy it, segregate it on a different worker node or for uh, the, the team that is building browser as a service, they want to be able to uh, really track and monitor the CPU, memory, storage network consumption uh, for that browser instance uh, for each tenant separately. And uh, the predominant way uh, that this is typically done today is uh, through some convention like uh, labels, when the platform team and the, their consumers will agree upon certain labels and then the, the ask will be uh, that in these Helm charts uh, or whoever is deploying the application, they make sure that the right labels are used or right labels are defined. Uh, but that is not such a straightforward problem to really check if the Helm charts uh, are including the right labels, or even if you can apply the labels on every resource that creates a, gets created as part of the Helm chart, because custom resources and the Helm chart can create custom resources, include custom resources. And uh, there is no way to know today uh, what all sub resources are getting created by that uh, operator who is man managing that um, custom resource. So essentially, uh, what it comes down to, the problem is really the platform engineering teams today face is how do you really uh, apply, define and enforce tenant level policies, for example, uh, deploying uh, separate uh, stacks on separate nodes? How do you track uh, consumption metrics for CPU memory storage network? And how do you just visualize uh, the tenant level resource topologies, which is uh, the graph of all the resources that are created as part of a particular tenant's stack. So we are addressing this problem uh, through Q plus and our basic idea is uh, let's wrap an API uh, around Helm chart. And uh, this API will basically provide a control point for, um, for the platform engineering teams to uh, really define and enforce uh, these kind of policies. And uh, it will also provide them a, a way to expose only those things that uh, they want to expose to the 
to the end user. So uh, exchanging Helm charts between, let's say, if there is a platform team who has uh, maintaining a Helm chart, they want, don't want to probably give it out to the uh, product or user teams to uh, create these stacks. So they want to keep that control. So th that is also possible by uh, defining an API. So that's the crux of uh, Q plus where uh, it, it, you, you give it input as a Helm chart uh, and uh, then define policies and monitoring and then Q plus will generate a API for you. And then you can create instances of that API to create actually the, uh, the stack uh, for every tenant. So Q plus is an open source framework to design multi-tenant platform services declaratively. Uh, it consists of two components. Uh, there, there is a uh, one component which we call as CRD for CRDs. Uh, which is essentially a top level uh, CRD called resource composition, using which uh, you can create uh, whatever CRD that you need for a particular platform service. So for example, in this picture, we have um, resource composition used to create WordPress uh, as a service CRD, MongoDB service CRD and so on. And then from those, you can actually instantiate uh, an instance of that CRD to create uh, an application stack. So that is one part of Qplus. The other part is uh, a, a set of Qcuttle plugins, which allow you to visualize uh, the runtime graph of uh, all the resources that are created as part of an application stack. So uh, we, uh, the, uh, the main components of uh, Qplus CRD for CRDs are, uh, as I said earlier, there is the resource composition as the uh, custom resource, uh, the top level custom resource. And then we also have resource policy and resource monitor custom resources. And uh, the, the, the main work that is done by Q plus is uh, uh, done through uh, a mutating webhook, a custom controller. And there is another module which uh, actually does the work of deploying Helm charts. Uh, we, we, we use and we depend on Helm charts being 3.0. Uh, so that is every Helm chart needs to be packaged that way using Helm 3.0. So here's the demo scenario uh, for today. So uh, WordPress as a service, the Helm chart uh, that we have built, uh, it, it is a uh, simple WordPress pod with a service ingress, uh, persistent volume and so on. And for its database needs, we uh, are using uh, the Presslabs uh, MySQL operator, uh, which uh, actually provides a MySQL cluster as the custom resource. So uh, a pod and a custom resource. Uh, and uh, so that the, the assumption that we are going to work with is the operator is already deployed. So that will be something uh, typically done by platform engineering teams. They will uh, work and deploy the operators ahead of time. Uh, so we start there and uh, we have for the demo, we have two worker nodes. Uh, it's all on GKE. So the first step that we, uh, and by the way, I have uh, screenshots just because it's easier, but this entire demo is also available on uh, GitHub. Uh, and I, I have pointers to it uh, towards the end. Uh, so the first step that we start out with is define the resource uh, composition CRD, which um, in this case is going to uh, take uh, the URL of Helm chart uh, as input. And this is the uh, Helm chart that uh, packages the WordPress pod and MySQL cluster. And in addition, there is a policy definition, uh, which is uh, we are on the left side, I've shown the policy definition where what policy we are going to apply is there are two policies. So the first part is uh, for every pod that gets deployed as part of this Helm chart, we want to define uh, the resource requests and limits. And uh, I have picked CPU and memory, some arbitrary values to just showcase uh, for the demo. Uh, so we are going to specify that as part of policy. And then the second part that we want to specify is on what node a particular uh, pod uh, needs to be deployed. And if you see here, uh, we have defined node selector as uh, values.node name. So essentially uh, that uh, allows us to customize uh, the inputs that we receive uh, for every tenant uh, for different nodes that can be deployed on different nodes. 
So with uh, this as input, you give this to Q plus and what Q plus generates uh, and you define the name, whatever name uh, that you want to define. So in this case, WordPress service is the name that uh, we are going to define and Q plus will register the Helm chart and will uh, register this new CRD uh, in your cluster. So that will be the first step. Now, once that is done, uh, the second step is uh, you are going to create instances of this WordPress service. So for tenant one, you will create uh, one instance. For tenant two, you will create another instance. Uh, so this is just showing uh, that uh, WordPress service instance and the spec properties of this instance are essentially going to come from the values.yaml of that Helm chart. So whatever the underlying Helm chart that you have built, uh, its values.yaml uh, will be reflected as uh, properties of this uh, custom resource. And that's why we see here the namespace tenant name. In this case, uh, these three node name, tenant name and namespace are going to be uh, inputs which the platform team will have to specify. So for different tenants, they can pick different node names. Uh, so this is the second step. Once you create this, what uh, you get is uh, the WordPress stack, which uh, I'm now using the Kubeless's uh, second component, which is the uh, Kubectl connections plugin to visualize this entire uh, resource graph. So what we see here is um, the WordPress service, WP service tenant one was the instance that we created. And uh, through behind the scene, what Kubeless did was when the instance of uh, WordPress service was created, it actually created all these resources. Uh, for uh, the MySQL cluster, uh, behind the scene, the actual uh, operator got uh, invoked and it did its right thing. And if you notice that the MySQL cluster tenant one has so many other resources uh, that it is creating. So Q plus is able to uh, discover all of these at runtime uh, by tracking four different relationships that exist between Kubernetes resources. So owner references, spec properties, uh, labels, and um, uh, so for labels, and uh, we have, um, uh, I forget the fourth one. Yeah, but uh, all the four properties that we uh, typically have for Kubernetes resources, we are able to track those. And uh, what we see here is uh, these, uh, top level uh, resources for Kubernetes uh, of WordPress service are uh, part of the Helm chart. So there is a secret, there is a service, ingress, persistent volume, and the pod. So these are uh, part of the WordPress, and then MySQL cluster is the uh, is the uh, other uh, resource part of the Helm chart. Okay, if you see, there are only two pods uh, that are part of this entire graph. And uh, we are able to discover these graphs. And uh, once we have these uh, parts uh, through these graphs, we are able to um, verify policies. So this, is, this slide is showing that uh, if you look at the pod for tenant one MySQL uh, and check its resources, then the li uh, limits and resource request limits and uh, 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 CPU and memory requests and limits, they are what were specified as part of the policy input. And uh, similarly, uh, if you look at the, the node name, uh, these were the node names that were specified when this particular tenant uh, instance was created. So what we do is as part of Q plus, uh, the mutating webhook is able to catch all the pods that are getting deployed uh, through that Helm chart. And then uh, we modify the spec properties of the pod uh, before the pods get deployed. So that way there is no restart of the pods and uh, before the pods are even uh, deployed, right policies uh, are embedded into the pod spec. And uh, because we are able to track the pods, then we are able to collect the metrics as well. Uh, so here uh, just is an output of another uh, Q plus uh, Q uh, plugin, which is Q metrics, which allows us to collect uh, CPU memory storage, uh, network bytes received, network bytes transferred metrics uh, for that particular instance. So in this case, for uh, this particular tenant, we are able to just uh, collect all these metrics and then 
Uh, these can be uh, exported in Prometheus format as well and can be seen in any, uh, any tool that supports uh, Prometheus format. So now, in order to uh, design this uh, approach, uh, one thing that we uh, really focused on was uh, how to create these APIs to wrap the Helm charts. And uh, uh, the approach that we chose was to uh, build this um, top level or meta API or CRD for CRD to create uh, these uh, platform, multi-tenant platform services. Um, the, the reason uh, we went this route is because it just makes it easy to uh, provide a declarative way to define these APIs with the monitoring and policy inputs. Uh, and the, uh, also the other approach uh, or the other reason is by having a resource composition as a top level uh, single uh, CRD, it, uh, it, it allows us to have a single operator. So, the, the custom controller that Q plus consists uh, contains for uh, resource composition that is a single custom controller running in the cluster and it's able to generate uh, any APIs and is able to handle uh, any APIs that you would create. Uh, as against this, something like uh, Helm operator would uh, actually create uh, a new operator for every Helm chart. So uh, just from um, the point of view of uh, footprint of this operational control plane, uh, having a single uh, operator just uh, is better. So those are the reasons why we went with this approach. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I just wanted to come here and present to this community. Um, we uh, are seeking inputs into uh, additional new features. We have uh, certain things planned uh, as part of our roadmap, but uh, also looking for adopters and just general inputs uh, from the community. Uh, thank you. Any questions, uh, thoughts? I'll be happy to answer them. I think this kind of reminds me a bit what um, I think the operator framework does with their Helm-based operators to, to some extent. They can also take my Helm charts, package it, and they get a new CRD for um, for the values file. C correct, uh, Alois. So uh, th this is the point that I was referring to, to uh, where we, uh, we, we've seen a Helm operator. Uh, the advantage of using a CRD for CRD is uh, you don't need to create a separate operator for every Helm chart. And uh, by my understanding of uh, Helm operator is you start with the operator SDK and uh, it will actually generate a new operator for uh, a Helm chart. Uh, and then you will have to instantiate that operator in your cluster. So essentially, let's say if you were to uh, consider something like this situation where uh, you want to have uh, an API for WordPress, API for MongoDB, or browser as a service in as part of the same cluster, then you would end up actually instantiating three different operators, uh, whereas with their own control planes. Uh, so the our approach is uh, different than that, where we are uh, actually allowing you to declaratively create these uh, APIs, uh, and the input that you provide to them is a uh, the, the link to the Helm chart, and that gets registered as part of creating the new CRD. And uh, then the consumers actually uh, consume, uh, create instances of that new uh, API which got created. So it, it actually creates, it does create a CRD. It's just that the, the user, so it creates a CRD for each Helm chart, but the user isn't responsible for creating that. Is that, is, I'm, I'm not yeah. quite clear on that. No, uh, you are correct. So the platform engineering team uh, is actually um, we, will declaratively define a new uh, CRD. Uh, let's say like use the resource composition to define uh, WordPress uh, as the uh, custom API. Uh, and as part of that, it will define the Helm chart. So platform engineering team will be only responsible for managing the Helm charts and they can uh, use them uh, from community, it doesn't matter. And then Q plus will actually install the new CRD and then it's able to 
um, also react to the events for those uh, new uh, API types. So for example, WordPress service is a new uh, new type that or new kind that gets registered, right? Or MongoDB service will be a new kind that gets registered. So Q plus has the machinery to actually react to uh, these kind of new new kinds or new types that that get uh, added at runtime by platform engineering teams. Okay. Does that answer the question? I think so. I think that the way that, the way that I understand it now is that the CRDs are in fact created. It's that you're shifting the responsibility from the platform team to be able to have to manage a whole host of CRDs using something like the operator framework or whatever whatever way they decide to create the CRDs. Um, yeah. Or system yeah. it takes so is responsible for that management. Correct. So Q plus takes over that. Uh, part of actually instantiating the CRD and uh, then providing uh, hooks uh, to define any policies that you want for uh, to apply on that entire Helm chart. So uh, right now we are focusing on uh, policies which are more the mutation based policies because a lot of these things uh, need to happen at the pod level. I mean, our entire, um, this approach stemmed from the point that operators uh, and custom resources, they create a lot of resources behind the scene, right? Like MySQL cluster will end up creating two, three pods and uh, those pods are not visible uh, outside in the sense the only abstraction that will be available outside is a MySQL cluster instance. So how do you really uh, control what gets specified in a pod? And it's possible that the operator developer might not have exposed all the pod specs at the custom resource level. So from there, uh, this entire approach actually stemmed where we want to be able to uh, mutate uh, what, or we want to be able to provide platform engineering teams a uh, way to uh, define mutations at the pod level. And because an application is uh, packaged as Helm chart predominantly, Helm chart is the packaging format that is used that we have seen. We focus th on that to take that as an input and then uh, it just made sense to uh, wrap an API around that. Uh, but then how do you really create that API? Uh, because as a platform engineering team, you might be uh, working with many different Helm charts, you know, and you, th there's no way you can actually create a separate operator for each of that Helm chart management. And so th that's why this uh, Uber CRD uh, actually sort of entered our uh, thinking that, okay, let's have a resource composition as the top level CRD, uh, which allows the platform engineering team to define new CRDs and just takes away the responsibility of them having to instantiate and create new CRDs. Can you talk a little bit about the boundary of kind of resource management with your mutating webhook? Things like um, how much of it is in the chart and how much of it do you expect to manage? Things like uh, no. replica sets, um, horizontal pod autoscaler or oh. vertical, and also yeah. all the policies associated with that. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. Um, so to be honest, we are uh, looking for inputs. And uh, right now, the policies that we have defined uh, are stemming from the uh, work that we have done with uh, our early adopters. Uh, so uh, the, the things that uh, we've uh, seen people ask for is uh, ability to uh, control the CPU memory uh, and just co-location of pods onto certain nodes. Uh, but you are right, there are, um, the, the one thing that is coming up next is uh, how do you really attribute network traffic to only uh, the, the tenant specific network traffic and more specifically uh, traffic that is outward facing, which is uh, by, by outward facing, what I mean is let's say in this particular application, WordPress pod is the one which is user facing, right? Internally it uh, uses uh, MySQL uh, pod, but uh, any network traffic that is, uh, that if we want to count, it has to go uh, counted for the WordPress pod uh, to, to be accurate. So uh, with through our connections, we will be able to track those, like which pod is the only outward facing pod. And that uh, also applies to the policies where um, the, the policies uh, around uh, what like HPA related things. Uh, if uh, ideally we would like to provide 
controls for everything that can be mutated uh, at the pod level. The pod specification al allows one to actually define a lot of things, right? And uh, it, it's possible that certain things are already defined in Helm chart. So then we do support override. So you can say as a platform engineer, you can say that I want to override what it's already in the Helm chart. But if you don't want to override, uh, the flag will tell you that. Uh, but, but right now, uh, the policies that we support today are the resource request limits, node selectors, and um, uh, then the next one that is coming up is um, uh, for uh, affinity, anti-affinity, uh, pod disruption budget. So there, there are a set of things that we are planning to do, and uh, we would love additional uh, inputs on what new things can be supported. Yeah, what, what I also can recommend is like we have this uh, little demo project here with potato heads to also have an example uh, available for, for potato heads. So people can simply try it out and uh, play around with it. Yeah. So that's the first thing I would do now. So that's. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, we'll share this, these links on the uh, Slack channel. Uh, so, if folks can provide, try it out and provide inputs, uh, that will be really great. And um, yeah, but uh, thanks for the opportunity to come here and present. Um, and if any questions uh, come up, we are also available on Slack. It's all open source. So, uh, feel free to try it out. Okay, that was a pretty packed meeting today. So we're almost on top of the hour. Uh, thank you Tom, for sharing yeah. anything new. Um, that was good, two new project presentations. So I see that um, we're gaining more momentum here. Next one, we will obviously move to the next session where I'll reach out to people. Yeah, thanks for both uh, presenters today. Obviously with Litmus guys. Uh, we will follow, follow up on next step here. And also thanks for the Q plus presentation. It's always great to see new projects that you haven't seen before and obviously multi-tenant deployment and more declarative uh, ways on top of uh, people need this and moving more into this platform idea are always uh, great ways to look at. Um, all right, then I would actually call it a meeting for today. Thank everyone for participating. And see you again in two weeks from now. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. See you. Join Kerton. Because I can't be